Okay, our next speaker is Mr. Mark Lee. Uh, good afternoon. It's, this is the afternoon meeting of the House Appropriations Committee on Wednesday, March 16th. And we are joined here by um, representatives of the Human Services Committee to hear um, H728, which is a um, uh, an act relating to opiate overdose response services. And, um, and, and Rep Whitman and Small, if you would like to join us down at the table, please do. And we are also joined by um, uh, Nolan Langwell, uh, with, and we have a fiscal note. So let's hear the bill first, and then we'll hear from Mr. Langwell and um, have a conversation about the bill. Uh, we could take a half an hour, no more than a half an hour. We're managing our time as, as everybody is doing. Um, and so if you can give us the high, the high level overview and then bring us down to the money and the reason that you're here with us today. So thank you for joining us and we'll turn it over to you. Hey, great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, for the record, uh, Representative Dane Whitman, I serve on Human Services <laughs> Committee. Uh, thank you again for having us here today to talk about uh, H-728. Um, so yeah, to put this bill into context, um, looking for a response essentially to the sort of second epi epidemic that we're experiencing, as we've described it, which is um, sadly uh, continued rates and fatal overdose largely related to opioids and specifically uh, fentanyl. Um, just to kind of put this into context, um, over the last three years, we've seen rates in opioid fatalities increase uh, dramatically. Um, in 2019, we had 114 fatal overdoses, and in 2020, that jumped up about 25% to 157 fatalities. And now in 2021, we're looking at 181 fatalities. So that's almost another 25, 30% jump um, just over you know, each year for two years. Um, really concerning, um, the median, median age for a fatal overdose is 40 um, in 2020. So we know that you know, half, if not more than half of these deaths are uh, young, young people. Uh, so this is a really concerning public health issue and um, just want to thank you all for your consideration um, of the proposals in here as well. Recognizing that this isn't the whole picture that you've also looked at our uh, recommendations within our budget memo um, and everything along those lines. Um, so uh, I would just like to say that essentially while, while the budget memo look to sort of fill gaps and strengthen a lot of our existing systems. Uh, this bill really sets the stage for more innovative initiatives uh, so that we can adapt to sort of the current day nature of the opioid and specifically uh, the fentanyl crisis that we're experiencing. Um, I'll just go through a large uh, walkthrough of the bill um, and sort of the way that uh, I think of it is that there's three main policy initiatives and then three sorts of pilot appropriations. Um, so the policy initiatives are related to expanding who can be designated as a syringe service provider. Um, the current health department language is pretty prescriptive about that and that it needs to be an um, aid service organization or a healthcare provider. And we're just looking to um, open that up so that if there are uh, opportunities to designate other organizations that come into contact with people who are injection drug users, that, that we have that flexibility. Um, the sort of sec second section of the bill is uh, related to prior authorization for medication assisted treatment. Um, I think we will return to this component as we've kind of received some new information about the potential fiscal impact of this. Um, so I think we'll sort of save that for last, if that's okay. Um, but the sort of third uh, policy committee, I'll turn it over to Representative Small, as she's been involved in the uh, overdose prevention site working group component. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Representative Taylor Small, for the record. Um, overdose prevention sites, also known as safe injection sites, um, are a program that we've seen internationally and now growing recognition here in the United States. Uh, we've done similar research into overdose prevention sites, but the difference now as compared to the past is that there are actually two areas within the state of Vermont in Burlington and then in Brattleboro who have significant uh, interest in upstanding an overdose prevention site within their communities, but need better guidance from the state to recognize whether there is legislative barriers to implementing these sites or whether it is uh, putting that onus back on the municipalities or the localities to be able to upstand uh, such a service. What I will highlight as we just covered uh, the immense increase in overdose deaths here in the state of Vermont is that uh, a key point of overdose prevention sites is that internationally we have seen zero deaths within overdose prevention sites, which is the goal I believe here is reducing our death rate for folks um, who are using drugs. And so I know that working groups are not your favorite option um, when looking at uh, options for investing funding, but it seems integral as a, a next step in the direction of being able to upstand those prevention site here in the state to put this working group into action. Um, so moving on, the sorts of uh, three pilot programs that we have included are related to uh, mobile uh, distribution of medication assisted treatment uh, and as well as recovery and treatment for justice involved uh, individuals. And the third being um, kind of facilitating warm handoffs and greater coordination uh, within our treatment and recovery systems. So to go into mobile MAT, a lot of this comes to a uh, need for greater access to specifically uh, methadone which is one of the medications provided um, within our hub and spoke system. Uh, currently, it's being limited to the hubs that we have around the state, uh, which mostly requires in-person visit during a very narrow window of time um, that doesn't necessarily work for everybody based on geography, based on work schedule, uh, things along those lines. Um, fortunately, the federal uh, rules around methadone distribution have changed recently to allow for mobile distribution of methadone. Um, so this is looking to sort of pilot within uh, one district, uh, you know, van, uh, if you will, that will, uh, with the purpose of expanding that access to per, uh, previously underserved regions of a district for a hub. Um, we do know an example of uh, the Howard Center has an existing van that's limited to buprenorphine prescriptions. So we're able to see a lot of their costs associated with that, which is how we've sort of based um, this number here for 450,000. Um, I'll move on. Uh, the second point of this is uh, supports for justice involved uh, Vermonters. Um, we have seen uh, over the past several years, some really tragic gaps in the continuum of services for um, both Vermonters within our uh, criminal justice system, within prisons, and especially upon re-entry or, or leaving prisons. Um, we have had a few tragic incidents, I think specifically with the Chin and Women's Correctional Facility, uh, where there is a, a really devastating loss of life following the release of several um, women. And uh, the goal here is to build those supports uh, for both substance use disorder counseling and recovery while people are incarcerated, as well as to create that continuum that upon re-entry that they are, again, I'll use this term warm handoff, that they are immediately connected to uh, the regional existing resource that is available, be it a recovery center, be it a hub and spoke provider, but that somebody is not, uh, uh, that somebody is fully aware and connected to the, to the resources available. And the third component of this um, is looking at kind of the opportunity to facilitate a peer network. Um, you know, recovery centers, 
uh, have their role as far as um, peer support, peer meetings, and this is maybe looking at an opportunity to um, create that network among just as involved people in recovery or seeking treatment. Um, you'll notice that we have given the department a great amount of flexibility within this to award one or more grants. Um, you may be aware that there was a previous uh, request for a, um, a specific recovery center dedicated to justice involved Vermonters. Um, and that is sort of within the purview, but we also wanted to recognize the work that's happening around the state existing where this uh, need may also need to be met. Um, so that's why we sort of didn't choose to spell out to a specific organization or recovery center within this language as it is. Um, going on to the final bit, um, which is the warm handoff component. Um, this is actually uh, something that has been implemented in a few parts of the state. Um, I can speak for uh, Bennington County having an example of this through their overdose outreach project. And essentially what this involves to put the language here um, clearly is that emergency medical uh, responders, first responders are constantly uh, going out to respond to overdose and resuscitating individuals, sometimes multiple times in a single night. Um, and we're really trying to see upon that point of contact with an individual, how do we make the most of that moment? Especially when it may be a point in time where an individual is more open to engaging in treatment or recovery after having that life-threatening experience. Um, so again, I think this creates flexibility of how um, an organization could propose facilitating these warm handoffs. But the example that we have in Bennington is for an on-call recovery coach to be able to accompany a first responder um, so that when that person is resuscitated, the recovery coach is there to have a follow-up with the individual, um, if possible, even make a direct referral to a treatment provider. Um, and so that is um, essentially what this is seeking to accomplish. Um, for some context there, the, um, uh, the grant awarded in Bennington was $45,000 to make this possible. And so the 180,000 that you see here is essentially looking at expanding this to four districts as, as a start. Um, I think within all of this, we wanna see um, these as sort of pilots, right? Within, within a limited capacity, but that may provide information about the opportunities available, say for when the um, opioid abasement uh, advisory group is looking at what are the options for investing resources in the future. Um, so that is that. And then going back to what we've sort of tabled, um, the uh, prior authorization component. So basically to provide a little bit of context and this front, um, there's currently about 9,000 uh, Vermonters receiving medication assisted treatment. And we have reason to believe that that's only about half of the Vermonters with opioid use disorder that would benefit from receiving treatment. So we're interested in seeing what sort of barriers to treatment may exist and how can those be alleviated so that people are more comfortable engaging in treatment. Um, one of the interests that uh, really uh, brought my attention to prior authorization was first hearing from a provider within our committee that they saw this as something that could hold off their uh, prescription plan and their treatment plans for hours um, while, while an insurance company needs to sort of sign off on whatever medication they've prescribed. And also um, a pretty significant study of almost a million people um, within Medicare. Um, Medicare removed prior authorization for MAT uh, and for this group saw that um, people engaged in treatment more so. Um, there's an uptake in people uh, engaging with treatment and a decrease in costs um, other healthcare costs, such as emergency room visits, um, inpatient treatment. So seeing that this policy um, as a whole is sort of, um, we're spending the money where we wanna be spending it, <laughs> right? Um, as opposed to on, on the other end. Um, but to give a little bit more uh, context here, um, 
There, in 2019, we passed a law that basically created for non-Medicaid insurers that as long as it was within the FDA's recommended dosage, um, that there was no prior authorization. We've looked at um, applying that to Medicaid now after receiving reports over the past three years that show that about 95% of the prior authorizations that take place, the vast majority, get approved ultimately. So each one of these is taking 30 minutes up to 12 hours, but the vast majority are getting the green light eventually. And we're wondering, are these additional wait times um, deterring people from engaging in treatment? And we've also learned that um, Medicaid really prefers a treatment plan um, that is focused on their preferred medication, uh, which in this case would be, uh, they have a few with on the list, but predominantly we'll see is um, Suboxone, um, which is a buprenorphine and uh, naloxone kind of combination. What we have found is that there are other treatment options that may work better for some patients. Um, but this prior authorization uh, process is a bit of a way that uh, Medicaid or the, or the treatment providers, I'm not exactly sure uh, who the noun is acting in this case, but patients are being directed into a certain lane, right? They wanna be prescribed Suboxone as opposed to other treatments that may work better with their physiology, right? So we saw an interest in uh, relieving a lot of these uh, restrictions. Um, we tried to curtail to the best of our ability things that we thought would make it um, sort of a negotiation between the two. But just um, yesterday, we received further information that really the amount of dedicating towards their preferred medications. Um, and there are a couple different things that go into this. I don't want to get too technical, but really, you wouldn't think that a brand name medication is going to be the most financially beneficial for uh, the medication spend, but in this case, it is. Um, and looking at people having, say, uh, the, the choice to pick something such as um, an innovative uh, medication such as Sublocade, which is much more expensive, um, the projections from uh, Diva for the changes as included within this bill we're anywhere from uh, 17 to $35 million, if I'm getting that uh, correct. So um, we are definitely, um, you know, we acknowledge the, the many demands <laughs> for resources that the Appropriations Committee is uh, receiving right now. Um, we believe that this work is still important and we're gathering more uh, information from providers, and uh, we're happy to say that Viva has expressed willingness to sort of uh, meet again to find something that may work um, to bring these costs down while still eliminating some of the barriers. But as it stands right now, this prior authorization piece as presented to you would be uh, even just for sort of um, moving outside of the current terms of their negotiation with um, medication uh, distributors and providers, that alone would be a $4 million hit to our sort of rebate agreement is, is my understanding. Um, so I hope that, I can only imagine how much information you are all taking in <laughs> at this time. I hope that enough of that got across um, and really would be happy to any hear any questions unless a uh, representative small has anything to add the only other piece that i will add to it is really recognizing how fentanyl has changed the landscape of the treatments that are, are needed here in the state of vermont which is why we're looking into the prior authorizations piece um, and hearing from spoke providers that the preferred medication is actually causing really um, intense withdrawal symptoms for folks that has helped not having them maintain on MAT and instead going back to using instead. Um, so really encourage that we're gonna continue this conversation um, and understand that there might be um, a widening of the eyes when you look at the estimated fiscal impact as currently presented. <laughs> 
Rep. Fagan. Thank you. So, is your recommendation here that we strike the prior authorization from the bill? Um, there is one component that uh, includes uh, them to continue reporting on their prior authorization. Uh, we would hope that that stays within the bill. You're going to have to tell us exactly what that is. Oh, those reports? Yeah, you said the reporting aspect. So I'm actually looking at the, and I just to, just to finish this conversation briefly, I'm actually looking at the uh, the DIVA's report for pharmacy claims and prior authorizations for calendar year 2021. Um, on the sublocate that you mentioned, uh, they had 584 claims that they paid. Uh, number of prior authorizations approved was 254. Number denied was 24. So that was a 91 point uh, four percent approval rate so i don't know what's good what's bad there but you know 91 percent seems to be a good number i, I don't know but anyway and hence the reason why you're gonna you want to continue yeah. to explore and again just to reiterate as you said wait time for authorizations 30 minutes up to 11.95 hours so um that's half a day at any rate so you're going to let us know which of these uh, sections exactly would need to be struck in order to, to have to have done what you have said you, you want to do, which is continue to look at this, number one. Number two, can you prioritize your entire request for us, please? These are the things that we want to, this is absolute must all the way down to, you know, some, they're all need to do, they really are, but just, you know, prioritize for us, please, what the, uh, what your committee would like to see done because you have no money, you have no money. And, and I hope that is understood. We are underwater with the budget requests that we have. We are cutting very significantly into important programs. I, I, I'm really excited and, and wish that I had more time to understand this because I, I can see there's huge potential here. Um, and, and a bit of what I'm wondering about also is, are there opportunities within existing programs within the hub and spoke and be moving some money around, et cetera. And you know, if we have another week, uh, Rep Bacon <laughs> has, has your portion of the, this portion of the budget, and you could put you had you yep. could think about it, yep. but we don't have another week. And um, it, it's frustrating because I can see the great value in what you're trying to do here. Uh, I, I think there I, were, and then yeah. I have one follow up. Um, I like the idea of the mobile um, uh, hub, and, yeah. mobile hub and spoke essential mobile hub rather. Um, so. The only, the only issue, of course, with that is that it needs to make the same round, I presume, every day, right? Is that because just so that everyone understands that, they, they, they need to go see all the same uh, patients on a daily basis because typically the patients go to the hub every day. I just wanted to make sure, you know. Yeah, and to put that into context, I think the current method is that uh, there are times Medicaid-funded transportation, yeah. picking up an individual and yeah. bringing them, yeah. and then bringing them back. Um, so I, I think that um, I can, the efficiency of the transportation is something to. I can also see the, the real worthiness of doing it this way because there are probably people that would prefer not to, to either can't or don't want to be seen doing it. Yeah. And this way, or are very uncomfortable doing it. So this way, we can get them on a treatment plan. No. Get on, you know, There's a lot of reasons to do it. To there really is. The, 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 okay. There are a bunch of. So, okay, I'm done. Jim, and, and I, my problem is I haven't had lunch. This is a scary I place for lunch. everybody. Yeah. So <laughs> Jim, Robin, Dave. And then uh, we have to get to the. Yeah, real quick, I just want to make sure I understand it. The $880,000 in the Vista note. That's one time, that's not ongoing, right? Uh, let's see. Um, so all of these are considered uh, pilot. I don't know okay, so <laughs> one just time. one time. Yes, Unless we continue. Time. Okay, secondly, what was the vote in your committee? 11 0. Okay, thank you. Robert, thank you. Um, and so there's 880, and then I figured around 10,000 for per diem, so it's about 890,000. Um, because you have of the 11 people on your working group, and I'm thinking that, that nine 
people need to get paid. So I could be wrong about that, but I it, I can speak. Uh, okay, fine. So anyway, I was just guessing. And um, uh, when you're talking about some of these other things, has um, the health care committee seen this? Uh, we're planning on a uh, drive by. Okay, is it is it in our committee now? We have it possession. Yeah, we have yeah. possession of it. We have a possession of it. Okay, so we also need to do a drive by with um, corrections and institutions. If you're talking about justice involved folks. Yeah, we have connected. And actually, sorry, I don't want to um, speak. Uh, I can't confirm whether or not we're doing a drive by in healthcare. I'm okay. sorry, that, that was speaking off the cuff. Okay. I'll confirm that. Um, we have. We have communicated with um, the chair and vice chair of corrections institutions, and they have no issue as stands. And similarly, we have had conversations with the House Health Care Committee, um, specifically looking at the DIVA section, the prior authorization. That's the problem. Um, and they were pending the fiscal note, um, which we have now received. In okay, so they're aware of this bill. They are aware, and we will continue the conversations as our amendment develops. Okay, okay. Uh, Dave? Did you have any testimony as to whether the general fund could match Medicaid in any of these instances? No, eight, nine, and 10? we were um, really hoping to leave that to your um, expertise as far as whether some of this could be applied to um, a global commitment um, or anything okay. along those lines. So we did not receive testimony appreciate, on those specific Appreciate plans. that. And then just to clarify, so if we did this divas estimating increased costs of 12 to 30 million in the uh, um, prior authorization that's what the cost would be Is that my understanding 17 to 35 million what was the 17 correct to 35 million and um that's rather significant and and they're saying Without the prior authorization, um, it, it would increase the, the amount of un, unnecessary, not necessarily the best choices. I'm just trying to. I think, I think, the, I think maybe the specific term would be preferred versus not. Thank preferred. you, preferred. Um, and that that's sort of a. Increase utilization of non-preferred medications, we, and that's we don't want that. Do we? So the technical term of, about preferred versus non-preferred has to do with their negotiations uh, as it relates to cost. I would say Thank that it has more to do with not cost than clinical. clinical. Mm -hmm. Appreciate um, that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. One more question from Rep. Fagan, and then let's turn to Mr. Langwell. Actually, I got it. okay. Then I have one question with two parts. Of course. <laughs> um, on the substance use support for justice involved Vermonters, is that a, a turning point style uh, concept up there in the in Chittenden County area? And, and of course, you're aware, I believe, that, that, that under the 1115 negotiation, they are negotiating to get that day into the 1115 waiver, the, the, the turning point concepts into the 1115 waiver. So it's not currently eligible, but it could be eligible <coughs> under the Assuming we get a new 1115 waiver under a new one. Oh, for the matching. Correct that's for matching. That's it, that's it. And then on the on the uh, overdose emergency response support, isn't that expert? Excuse me. Isn't that expert? Expert. Yeah, expert. So, um, it's a uh, um, uh, referral to treatment. Brief uh, yeah, no, no. Uh, screen brief brief intervention referral to treatment. And I believe that that most um, health and human services offices have been trained. Or some staff people have been trained in expert, and I believe uh, I know our hospital has a expert clinician or had an expert clinician. This committee funded one um, in the emergency room, so I'm wondering, you know, where's the uh, how, where's the linkage with that that concept? Yeah, well, I will say that one of the main. Uh, let me answer your first question: uh, whether or not these will be recovery coaches. Um, again, there's flexibility. I would say it could be either a certified recovery coach. Uh, which would fall under the 1115 waiver doesn't necessarily need to be um, within Chippewa County, <laughs> obviously, um, but that it could be um, either that or say a uh, licensed uh, alcohol and drug abuse counselor. Uh, let me ask it another way. Did you take any testimony that, that refers this to screening brief intervention referral treatment concept that the state was using? 
four years ago, and I don't know the current status of, so I'm asking you what the current status is of that. Yeah, we did not receive testimony on that. And I think that's your, your second question as it relates to the sort of 180,000 for warm handoffs. Yes. Yeah, so um, my understanding is that one component of this is uh, sort of developing the memorandums of understanding between various stakeholders. Um, typically, if an emergency first responder is going to go to the site, um, that medical information can't really be readily spread to all of the other available stakeholders. So that's one role of these um, on-call recovery coach is to walk through that process. Um, I, um, the expert is new information to me, so I, I'd be happy to uh, look into that. Off on that, please. Let me know. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, big important. We should talk for an hour about this, but we can't. So I'm not seeing any more questions from us, and I'd like to get Mr. Limewell down here to talk to us about the fiscal note. Um, so you, if, if perhaps you'll wait and see if there's more conversation. Um, but it's my understanding that you're going to come to us with a proposal of amendment we're going to need to see where we're comfortable. Thank you for the question about um, prioritizing. A question that I have is also, can this be fit into existing budgets? Is there something in ADAPT that we're not doing when, when the mention was made with regard to the mobile, that you know, not as many people are going to have to be transported up to the hub? You know, is there a bit of savings there that we could book legitimately? I mean, so let's do some really creative thinking. And I'm sorry, I keep looking at Peter because it, this is his, and we don't have any time. But let's let's try to see if there are opportunities there. Um, so, Nolan, come on down. Or yeah. Off or over. Yeah. Thank you very much. For the record, no line well, Joint Fiscal Office. Um, let me just touch upon quickly some of the questions that were asked. Uh, for deals, I'll start with that, Representative Shai. Uh, it's $6,000 estimate, that's the high end. Okay. Generally, when it's that low, I just say it can be absorbed within the existing budget, so I don't think it needs an appropriation because it's so small. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't okay. worry about an appropriation for that. I wouldn't recommend that one's needed. Um, the question about one time, Representative Harrison, I wish I'd uh, thank you for that clarification. I will put that in my next version of fiscal note to make it clear. Um, and then to represent the Yakovoni's questions about FMAP, Medicaid match. Great question. I'm going to follow up with the department on that. That said, I suspect it would be have to go under investments, and we all know what the problem with investments are. Certainly. So I'll follow up, but I, I suspect that would be an investment issue. And given the current state of unknownness and global commitment, that would be a consideration. Um, other than that, I'll guide you to page three, the fiscal summary um, discussed there. Regardless of what, what happens with the prior authorization conversation, um, there's still you know eight hundred eighty thousand dollars in grants, so there is still an appropriation of eight hundred eighty in the current version. Um, as to the prior authorization stuff, you know, we did hear testimony earlier uh, from Dio explaining it. And the, the, the pieces I will highlight are one that um, prior authorization is, in, to represent Yakubone's point, it is a tool used to control utilization. And so the sense is without prior authorization, they won't have control over utilization to, to push to guide people to the therapeutic equivalent that's a preferred drug that would, in their theory, do the same thing. Um, that said, most of that, this is the thing I found most compelling, most of that money, the, the 12 to 30, was for one drug called sub, Sublicate, which costs over $20,000 per year per patient. So that's, that's where a lot of that estimate came from. In terms of the impact, the other piece we heard that would affect 
about four million would be supplemental rebates. And that's because when they negotiate with the pharmacy manufacturers, they're required to have a prior authorization policy. And if they don't have a prior authorization policy, as I understand it, they're not eligible for a rebate. So that's why there's the loss of rebate. So that's the two big pieces of where of what their estimate uh, why it was so big. That's my answer. So I just want to because when I first heard that, my jaw hit the ground too. I was <laughs> Representative Fagan at the time, and I we could our, both of our jobs at the table so hard, everyone looked. No. <laughs> so, so I just wanted to just sort of explain, sort of like how, my understanding of from conversations or from the testimony we heard, why that number is so big. Um, and on that, I don't have anything further to present unless you have questions. Yeah. Um, Peter and then Robin. Thank you. Clarifying question, if I may. The prior authorization regarding the uh, the rebates, as you said, a prior off that needs to be in place in order for the rebates to exist. Um, does a removal of it one prior off affect all rebates, or is it just limited to a specific drug? Yeah, that's. A, I don't know the answer to that. It's a great question. That I would, that's a question I have to defer to um, the Medicaid. Oh, Robin? Yeah. So who pays if there's a 17 to $35 million? So that would basically mean that the Medicaid costs would increase. That's what I want to know. That's the effect of what happened. Yeah. So And so we would have to cover that expected increase in utilization in the budget. The EVA budget would go up by that. By that amount of money. By the way, I should have clarified too. That's gross. Okay. Not matched. That's gross. So we don't know what the number is that would be. Well, I mean, we would if we were going to do this policy, we would put a number in. Yeah. And then I'd have the gross and the. You know, it's forty. You know, and the state share is forty-four point oh two percent. So basically half almost. Yeah. Okay. A little less than that. Even forty-four percent of seventeen million dollars is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Very large yeah. number. Okay. Any more questions for Noah? Not seeing any. Uh, so work is being done. At some point, we have to say oil and country on all of the bills. Um, if I mean, this needs to get done by tomorrow, tomorrow being Thursday, uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, so. Um, is it work harder, work faster? That's what you said. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.